You're listening to Modern Intimacy, a show about mental health, sex, relationships, and the private things we need to talk about more publicly. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Balistrieri. As a licensed psychologist, certified sex therapist, certified sex addiction therapist, and packed trained couples therapist, I help people live more fulfilled lives by shattering stigma, erasing shame, and building connections. It's no secret that we live in a society that compartmentalizes mental health and sex from our everyday lives. On this show, we're going to change that, and we'll do it by getting curious together. In this podcast, I'll invite you to join me as I investigate the relationship between sex, mental health, relationships, and modern society. In each episode, it's my goal to provide safe, smart, dimensional, and practical answers to those complex questions you've been wondering about. Head on over to modernintimacy.com slash podcast for show notes and resources, or to submit a question or topic you'd like me to explore in future episodes, as well as to find all the links to follow us on your favorite podcast apps so you don't miss an episode. Don't forget to follow me on TikTok and Instagram at Dr. Kate Balistrieri for daily tips on how to improve your mental health, sex, and relationships. Everyone has questions. You are not alone. On this show, I make information accessible because everyone deserves to have more integrated, healthy, and sexually satisfying relationships. Thanks for joining me. Let's get started. Tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, your background, your area of specialty, and how you got into this work. Sure. So uh, my name is Asia Sullivan. I'm a certified physician assistant, and I'm working in Los Angeles. I am primarily working in primary care for the LGBTQ community and a little bit of infectious disease as well. Um, But primary care and preventative medicine is really kind of the bread and butter of what I do. I'm originally from Alabama, as you can probably tell, Um, (laughs) but I've been out in LA for about two and a half years now. And um, so yeah, kind of on a day to day, you know, I I take care of of all kinds of stuff, annual physicals, and I do a lot of prep and HIV work, Mm -hmm. uh, mental health, definitely, you know, with primary care, we're kind of a first stop for folks who are experiencing Mm -hmm. some, um, you know, issues with anxiety or depression, a little bit of sick stuff, you know, broke your toe, sinus infection, a little bit of everything. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. How did you come to specialize in working with the LGBTQ community? Uh, yeah. So um, it's maybe not so much, oh, my light went out. <laughs> maybe not. Well, actually, I, I would say that here in LA as well, um, it's a little bit of an underserved community, especially mm-hmm. because, um, you know, when we're in medical school and PA school and nursing school, there's not really that much focus on the community and the specific health needs of the community. Um, I identify as lesbian, so I wanted to kind of serve my own community. Mm -hmm. And um, I got started in HIV work in undergrad. So I did a lot of HIV research and worked as a medical assistant in an HIV clinic. And, um, you know, HIV and the gay community are are inherently linked. And that's kind of how I Mm -hmm. fell into this role in primary care. Nice, nice. I'm I'm so excited to have you on the show today because, well, for so many reasons, um, but but one, because I recently have been seeing a lot of conversations on TikTok, um, Instagram, and certainly within my own practice about people running into different obstacles um, when they are seeking medical care and mental health care. And when I saw the work that you do, I thought it might be a really interesting conversation for us to have to talk about what kind of training prepares physicians, PAs, nurses, um, you know, for working with underserved populations, particularly the LGBTQ population. And as you mentioned, there really isn't a ton of training. So I wonder if you can maybe speak to that. And obviously I know you can't speak for every school and every program out there, but what's your general experience of what providers do get exposed to? Sure. So really I feel that And again, you're exactly right. It really depends on where you were trained and Mm -hmm. what program you went to and what population that program works with. So for me, I I grew up in and was trained in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And so that's obviously going to be a very different environment than, say, here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, my experience was really that... 
LGBTQ healthcare was focused from, you know, most of the focus was placed on things like sexually transmitted infections and HIV Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, condom use and those types of lifestyle modifications. But we really didn't talk more about um, what I feel is probably even more important, which is just really how to create an environment that is comfortable and that is welcoming to folks Mm -hmm. in the community. Mm -hmm. Um, It's almost half the battle really to for um, someone who is identifies as LGBTQ plus to kind of walk in somewhere and know that they feel welcome, that the provider yes. is competent. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's probably even more of an important thing than the true, you know, medicine and medications of it all. Right. And in terms of, especially for the trans community, you know, that's mm-hmm. something I don't know really if if any programs are focusing on, um, you know, the ins and outs of hormone therapy and mm-hmm. how to initiate that conversation with your patients. So for me personally, everything I learned about that has been on the job from mentors and my supervising mm-hmm. physicians. Um, so those are areas that um, I would like to see a bit more broad training in mm-hmm. medical specialties. Um, but again, you know, it's kind of really the, the, the first part of the battle is just making sure that the patient feels included, feels welcome, mm-hmm. and, it, and that you've created a, a safe space for them. So what are some ways that providers can do that? Right? What are some right. of the, the, the ways that you immediately recognize that is um, feasible? Right. Um, It can be, you know, small gestures, even I feel go a long way, you know, like even for me, I remember in college, I would go and speak to professors after hours. And for example, some of them would have the little, you know, rainbow safe zone sticker on their Mm. door. And so just these kind of like outward displays of, hey, we are an ally or we are a safe space for you. So Mm -hmm. um, there's different, you know, ways to kind of publicly display that even, you know, whether it's on your website or, um, you know, just putting in a byline somewhere that we are, you know, LGBTQ plus friendly providers, just Mm -hmm. kind of making it outwardly known Mm -hmm. and also doing some research on um, how best to formulate your intake form. So Mm -hmm. we found a lot of, um, or we've had a lot of feedback on our intake forms. And one thing that we did, for example, was um, we had, you know, male, female, trans Mm -hmm. as options, but Mm -hmm. now we know that there are so many different gender identities out there. And um, what we have done personally is left that space as a blank fill-in box. Oh, that's Um, wonderful. Yeah, so you don't even have to kind of pick your box and then, mm-hmm. you know, we kind of, we kind of thought about having a, a box that said other, but that doesn't feel good, you know, to a patient to have to, com- to immediately other yourself right yeah, out the door. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. um, just small gestures like that really go mm-hmm. a long way. Putting in your documentation, the patient, what the patient prefers to be called, if it's mm-hmm. not their legal name, mm-hmm. what pronouns they prefer to use, mm-hmm. um, you know, when you're taking a, of course, in primary care, we want to take a, a detailed sexual history. So Mm -hmm. asking those questions in a way that is non-judgmental. And um, so those are kind of the the easy things I would say that Mm -hmm. anybody can do. Right, right. What are some of the more challenging things for providers who, you know, maybe haven't been in school for a while or who don't have access to, um, you know, the kind of on the job training that might really equip them well for this, but they really want to be supportive allies in a safe space. Like what are the more challenging things that they're going to bump into and how might you think about, you know, and, and brainstorm out loud how they can sort of bridge that gap? Sure. Um, well, and, you know, especially for for those who aren't getting hands-on kind of on the job training, and that mm-hmm. may be hard to come by depending mm-hmm. on, you know, where you live and what type of specialty that you're working in. So mm-hmm. um, I find a lot of it is really almost on the provider to kind of do some self-education. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot, a lot, a lot of resources out there. Um, there's the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, mm-hmm. Um, they're fantastic. You know, they're always posting kind of up-to-date guidelines on, Mm -hmm. for example, you know, how frequently should we screen for HIV and other STIs? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, one big part of of LGBTQ healthcare is PrEP or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, PrEP and PEP services to prevent um, HIV infection. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing that really any provider can prescribe and it's Mm -hmm. not complicated Mm -hmm. whatsoever. Um, So there's that. There's also um, actually the, um, 
where am I going with this? Oh, there's a website called OutCare okay. that will come to your, they will actually send trainers to your offices really? to kind of, yeah, they kind of go through all of your, you know, mm. intake forms. They go through your processes with patients and can kind of make sure that you are up to date on the latest lingo that we're using, that mm. we're not using outdated terminology mm. and those sorts of things. So those are my two kind of favorite resources that I like to tell folks about would be the Gay Lesbian Medical Association and OutCare. Well, those are amazing resources to know about. Thank you. And we'll be sure to include them in the show notes for anybody who wants to hearken back and, and get access to that because that'd be great. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, what are some of the experiences that you've heard from patients about how they have felt really sort of uh, nurtured and enveloped in their medical process, whether their medical needs are related to sex or gender or not? And what are the ways in which um, patients have described to you feeling uh, alienated or really not like they were in a safe space? Sure. Um, lots of different ways. So uh, ways that that patients may feel, you know, alienated is a lot of a lot of how the interaction with the mm -hmm. provider and the staff go. Mm -hmm. um, for example, people may be treated differently based on their HIV status. If they're living with HIV, sometimes there's a stigma already associated with that. Or for example, they come in, you know, requesting STI testing that may not be the typical screening, you know, um, there's more that goes into kind of a full STI screening than I think a lot of us realize, even that mm. I realized. Mm. Like and what? So, um, you know, to be, I don't know, I guess anything goes here. So for example, when a lot of folks walk into say an urgent care or mm -hmm. even their primary sometimes and say, hi, I'd like to be tested for STDs or STIs. Um, a lot of times that includes some blood work and then mm -hmm. a urine test, mm -hmm. but oftentimes the throat swab is skipped and a rectal swab is skipped and people really aren't comfortable asking patients, you know, hey, are you engaging in oral and anal sex? You know, that's mm -hmm. a personal question, but mm -hmm. that's a way, that's a, a big problem in that a lot of STIs can be missed that way. Another thing that I always think about that may not be so common knowledge mm -hmm. is um, fecally orally transmitted illnesses, things mm -hmm. like Giardia, Shigella, E. coli. Um, based on certain sexual practices, that can also be considered an STI. And so mm -hmm. it's always something that we try to ask folks about, you know, mm -hmm. are you experiencing any GI issues and that mm -hmm. sort of thing? Um, because those are just kind of the things that fall to the wayside. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, if you identify as lesbian, you really aren't screened appropriately for STIs because there's a pervasive belief that, you know, lesbians don't get STIs, which is mm. not true. Not true at all. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we kind of need to, I, I feel that providers should feel comfortable and, mm. you know, involved enough to kind of ask your patients more personal questions. Mm -hmm. And I've always found that the patients actually appreciate that because mm -hmm. it could be that um, STIs go missed for a long time just because someone didn't feel comfortable enough to ask or didn't right. know to ask. Right, right. I really appreciate what you're saying right now because one of the things that I think um, in the mental health field we could do better is talking about sex as uh, in a detailed way, um, even if you're not a sex therapist and asking the same kinds of questions because all of our um, behaviors and our thoughts around it, our experience of our own bodies, all of these things are connected. And I find that one of the things that can implicitly help people feel safe and nurtured or not is how comfortable their providers are with some of these very human conversations that need to be had. And if they can trust that you're not going to get squeamish and you're mm -hmm. not going to feel weird about a conversation. Or judge them for what they yeah. may be doing. Yeah, then they can open up and that gives them better medical care and better, better mental health care, which is really the goal. Absolutely. And I think it's, it is, it's good for, for patients' mental health, whether, whether you're gay, straight, or, you know, however you identify to right. actually feel that you can talk to the provider about these more personal things and know that mm -hmm. you're not going to be judged and that no one is feeling, you know, as you said, squeamish by these, um, you know, these activities that are, are far more common than, than Absolutely. people would think. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so what are some of the ways in which members of the LGBT community might be able to 
screen providers to figure out if they are a safe place, for example, when they're calling to set up an appointment, if they don't necessarily want to overtly ask the question? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, nowadays, I feel that it's become more popular to kind of outwardly express that mm -hmm. at, from an office. Um, but again, you know, I'm speaking kind of from a bubble here in, mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, it's yeah. almost a necessity to, to mm -hmm. kind of express that. But so many other places in the country, we know that's not the case. And mm -hmm. so um, I guess it's really, unfortunately, on the patient to kind of do some research, maybe read some reviews or kind of skim through the social media. Mm -hmm. um, one question that may, I don't know if the question necessarily would out the person, but it might be worth asking, you know, do you provide PrEP and PEP services? Do you provide hormone therapy for the trans mm -hmm. community? And even if those things don't necessarily apply to you, mm -hmm. if the answer to those questions is yes, you can kind of feel a little more comfortable that, mm -hmm. you know, this person is with it, that they're an inclusive provider. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not always obvious. And, you know, mm -hmm. not all patients want to call up and say, you know, hey, are you comfortable seeing gay patients or whatever it may mm -hmm. be? Right. Um, so, you know, doing, doing a little research, but also I would encourage patients to not be afraid to ask that question directly, mm -hmm. um, because the response that you get will probably tell you everything you need to know. Yes. Amen. I mean, that is so true. Just being able to discern if somebody's voice and in their answer is receptive and open mm -hmm. is going to give you a lot of information. Um, because even if they say yes, but there's a terseness in their voice or something like or that. Or hesitation yeah. or yeah. Mm -hmm. you can kind of pick up on, pick up on that vibe because chances mm -hmm. are, if they are inclusive, you know, the answer is going to be, oh yeah, absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. come on mm -hmm. in. Exactly. Yeah. I wonder if you know of any resources for people who maybe don't have um, providers nearby that are safe and inclusive um, for ways that they can find people uh, maybe a little bit more further away from them ge uh, geographically or even on a national scale if there are any places where they can call for consultation or free advocacy. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you asked because there are, um, especially in the pandemic here recently, there are telehealth services mm -hmm. popping mm -hmm. up all over the place and probably the most accessible and most well known, you know, more, um, I think they are operating in 30 of the 50 states right now mm -hmm. is Folks, F-O-L-X. Mm -hmm. um, they provide at home STI screening, they provide shipped to the patient's door hormone therapy, they're soon launching prep and pep services. Mm -hmm. um, so I really like that company because it's telehealth based. Mm -hmm. And um, I mentioned them before, but OutCare, mm -hmm. um, it's a website. They actually have a search engine where you put in your zip code and you put in what type of provider you need, whether that's primary care or a gastroenterologist or a gynecologist mm -hmm. or whatever. And it will match you to people who have registered themselves as OutCare providers. Wow. Um, so that's a really great service. Folks is a great service. Mm -hmm. um, even NURCS, N-U-R-X, you know, they're most commonly, or they're well known for providing birth control, but they've mm -hmm. even kind of expanded into PrEP and PEP and STI services. Mm -hmm. So um, telehealth is really an, a good way for you to access care, even if you may live, you know, somewhere more rural or in what we call a healthcare desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's such an amazing resource. And maybe one of the silver linings that's come out of the pandemic, right? We've really expanded our ability to provide care in so many different ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I've never, you know, I've, I've, I've even had to change my care. I've never really was a telehealth provider until mm -hmm. now. And now I would say it's about 50, 50, um, in-person and virtual consults. Mm, that's amazing. That's amazing. What is it like for you to do them virtually now? It's different. You know, it requires a lot more, I would say, active listening, not mm -hmm. that I wasn't listening to my patients before, but when you're in person with a patient, you know, you can give them a physical exam, you can, you know, touch the spot, see if right. it's painful, those sorts of things, run labs, order mm -hmm. imaging. And in a telehealth situation, really, all you have to rely on is your communication skills and what the patient is telling you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some things can be evaluated, a rash, you know, something like that. But the vast majority of, of telehealth is really kind of gleaning out what's important and what those kind right. of diagnostic details are, which is 
is challenging. Yeah, yeah. What, what's your perspective on the connection between, you know, healthy medical care and uh, medical care that really is advocating for the whole person and mental health? Sure. So um, we kind of think I, I uh, am from a public health background. And so mm -hmm. we say there's this common saying that, you know, health is not merely the absence of disease, but rather, um, you know, sound mental health and physical health and socioeconomic health and mm -hmm. um, all these kind of multiple factors that go into making a person healthy. And mm -hmm. so um, I think we've all experienced, you know, um, mental health has a huge out or a huge impact on our physical health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people talk about having nervous guts and you get heart palpitations <laughs> and all those sorts of things, you know, if you feel mm -hmm. anxious. And we know that depression can make a person's perception of pain worse and those mm -hmm. sorts of things. So the, the mind and the body is, you know, we pretty much all know are so intrinsically linked. And mm -hmm. um, from a primary care perspective, I would say that they're equally as important. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're really having to take the person's entire situation into account. Um, not so much, you know, do you prescribe the right medicine, but rather, you know, is the patient open to the medicine? Can they afford the medicine? You know, right. all the, all of these multiple things that go into what makes a person healthy. And I feel that it probably stems from mental health. You know, if, if the mental health is in a, in a bad place, it's almost the physical health becomes almost negligible, you know, because mm -hmm. they're not able to fully enjoy their life and live their life to the fullest. Right. Right. I feel like that's a feedback loop, right? If, if either mental or physical health are a bit wobbly or wonky, it can really impact the other. And then they just sort of feed off of each other, right? Because pain does become more severe. And then that severity creates more depression and mm -hmm. helplessness. And so it really does become um, a, a dance between the two, between the mind and body. And absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and, and really kind of creating a space for any patient, regardless of who they are and where they're coming from and what their background might be, creating a space for them to be able to kind of fall apart in a way that's healthy and um, contained is really how I see the role of a provider, at least in the mental health field, because when people know they've got a, you know, a contained space where they can go and, and just say, okay, here are all my pieces and they hurt and I don't know what to do with them right? Then we, we now have the task of helping them kind of put themselves back together in a way that's really meaningful. And I feel like that gets really lost when patients feel like there's something about who they are that is going to make getting access to care very difficult. So I'm really grateful for all of your wisdom today and, and for your help and kind of helping us think through what are some options, what are some things to look for, and maybe some um, things to uh, use as a discerning point in finding the right provider for any given person. Right. And it's really, um, you know, it's uh, health care and mental health is a, mm -hmm. is a team approach, you know, yeah. just having your, uh, a primary care provider that you can trust is essential and it's amazing and it's wonderful, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this too with your patients. You know, it's not just having a doctor or a PA, yeah. it's also having a therapist. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's having a dietitian. Sometimes you need a specialist in yeah. place or um, especially as it pertains to mental health, having a mm -hmm. good psychiatrist. And, mm -hmm. and all of those things can be difficult to kind of establish and find yeah. the right people. But if you're able to, if the patient is able to, and, and this is something that I try to help them navigate, having kind of that circle of different providers in different mm -hmm. areas who are all on the same page, all have the same goal yeah. of maximizing the patient's health. I mean, it really can be life-changing. It can. It absolutely can. Oh. I really appreciate your holistic view on this because it's so necessary, right? We don't live in a bubble. No one Correct. of us is just walking around as a medical person or a psychological person or a financial person. We all have all of these different elements to us. And the more we can respect the interconnectedness of all these different domains, the healthier we will be as a whole. That's really Absolutely. Cute. As a whole person and as a whole community. Yes. Yes. Amazing. Is there anything that we didn't touch on today that you think would be really helpful for any member of the LGBT community, um, excuse me, LGBTQ plus community to really kind of um, understand about, 
you know, how you see medical treatment with this community or what they can really expect or, or could hope for? Yeah, I think um, the, the, what I would like to leave with is just that I think honestly, and probably, you know, not just within the, within the gay and the LGBTQ community, but even everyone has had a, a mm. negative experience with healthcare and a negative experience with a particular provider. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just want to kind of emphasize that don't let that discourage you because there are people out there whose passion it is to serve you and serve mm -hmm. this particular community. And so, you know, I find it, sometimes hard not to be jaded by a lot of the barriers and the obstacles that are in the way, but I would encourage, you know, if you're unhappy with your provider or you don't feel comfortable or you don't feel empowered by them and mm -hmm. whoever that may be, whether that's your doctor or your therapist or your, mm -hmm. I don't know, your accountant or whatever, you know, <laughs> yeah. find somebody else, find yeah. somebody else. There's somebody <laughs> out there. And, um, you know, you, if you're, if there are any red flags, if you're not comfortable, right. you know, I want people to feel empowered to make that change and to actively seek someone who is going to be a better fit for them yeah. and just to not give up. You know, there are those resources out there that I mentioned and, um, and that's something I wish that I had known as well, kind of coming up in rural Alabama, I wish somebody had kind of just told me like, listen, it's okay to leave if you're not happy with what you're getting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so important. I'm really glad you brought that up because I think um, oftentimes people will sort of defer authority, defer power to the Absolutely. provider and you know, providers have a certain set of expertise, but they don't live in your skin. They don't know who you are every day in and out. And so if, if it's not a good fit, it's okay to say this isn't a good fit and to find someone else. Absolutely. Know? And to, you know, and to not give up <laughs> until you do find that person yeah. because, um, but they're, you know, they're out there in, in yeah. every different specialty and every career. And, um, you know, I, I hope that people feel empowered to find that for themselves and to not be afraid to seek those services. You know, if you, if you realize that, hey, you know, I really do need a therapist, I really do need a psychologist, a psychiatrist, um, to not feel shamed and to feel more, you know, empowered in going out yeah. and seeking those services. Yeah, absolutely. You have a right to care. Right. You have a yes, right to be a exactly. Human. Yeah. A right to good care, a right yeah. to competent care. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. Where can people reach you if they have any questions or want to schedule an appointment with you or find out more about the work you do? Absolutely. Um, you, so the practice that I'm with in Los Angeles is called Sweet 401 Medical. And we're a group of um, a bunch of providers and you can kind of, you know, scroll through us. If it's me you'd like to see, I'm more than happy to see anyone. I, I see everyone, you know, not just LGBTQ folks. I see plenty of straight heterosexual folks as well. Um, so I encourage anyone who was inspired by this conversation, if you'd like to see me in person or over telehealth, I'm happy to do that. Um, so sweet401medical.com, you'll find us. And I'm also on Instagram at Couture in Clinic all one word. So feel free to follow me, DM me. I always respond. Um, so those would be the best ways to get in touch with me. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. This was fun. Thank you for listening to this episode of Modern Intimacy. Follow our show on your favorite podcast app by going to modernintimacy.com slash podcast. And while you're there, don't forget to enter in a question or a topic idea for future episodes. That's modernintimacy.com slash podcast. This show is for educational and entertainment purposes only and is not a substitute for therapy or psychiatric care. Listening to this show or submitting questions or topic ideas does not constitute a therapeutic or professional relationship with Dr. Kate Balistrieri or any providers that work at Modern Intimacy. If you're having a medical or psychiatric emergency, please call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. All opinions expressed by guests on this show are those of the guests only and are not necessarily indicative of those opinions held by Dr. Kate Balistrieri or staff at Modern Intimacy. Thank you for listening to today's show. For more episode information and helpful tips, visit modernintimacy.com or follow us on Instagram at The Modern Intimacy or follow Dr. Kate on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Kate Balistrieri. See you next week.